Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Hey everybody, it's Rado. It is indeed. Well, we're doing this, if you are on, we're doing this every two weeks now, and so in two weeks from now, it will be on Rado Runs Through Channel. And so, yes. we're just here to talk about board games and see what's going on, and I, well, I know what game that is in front of Rado, because I just reviewed yes, I it. Yes, I have to, uh, the, the big day is tomorrow, so after we're done, i got to film my final thoughts for it. Um, after having played it for, uh, gosh, almost a dozen times now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, the timing of this, because this might have been an interesting back and forth talk about it. Um, my review will go up on Thursday, actually. So, um, well, I figured I'd let everyone else get, uh, let everyone else scuffle out of the way. Um, so. <laughs> Saved a I, really big show for. No, no, I can't even say more without uh, spoiling it. So, um, okay. we'll talk about that later. Um, next two weeks, maybe, maybe. But yes, that is a uh, pendulum. If you're wondering what we're talking about, that was an interesting hint. I think I'll have to talk to you a bit more after we're done. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're reading too much into it. But anyhow, um, oh, by the way, you are loud. I am quiet. Tom is loud. Rado's quiet. What a shocker. Yep. <laughs> I don't think the pendulum, I hardly knew him, even works a little in this case. If you're gonna I, do I, a... I appreciate it. Dreadful. Well done, sir. No, well it's done. not well done. Any word that ends in um, you can't then do that joke oh, with. Come on. No. My humor is... No, my humor... <laughs> my humor is fine. Uh, I... um, all right. So, uh, you're playing pendulum, and you can't really talk about the thing on that here. Um and we I was talked gonna... about the um, embargoes last week, so I don't imagine we have to hit that again. That's true. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about more games as time goes by. So to save us time, we're going to jump right into our mechanism, and then we will uh, keep going. We'll get to our top five and so on and so forth. So mechanism for today. We've been looking at the card game mechanisms somewhat in order, even if we went from card drafting to drafting last time. We're yeah, we went a... really off the rails last week. I mean, we were completely out of our element. And I, after we were done, I realized I need to redouble my efforts to complain less and just talk about games more, I think. That really should be our goal with this segment. Well, so we're actually briefly looking at this card play conflict resolution mm -hmm. that says each player simultaneously or sequentially plays one or more cards. These modify the base outcome of a conflict and allow various special abilities to apply. This is actually one of my favorite conflict mechanisms, you know, where you Cosmic Encounter has this, uh, Blood Rage has this. Lots of games, you both play a card, reveal it. Um, that being said, I'll do a top ten list on this in the future. This is not. Oh, you like it that much? Okay. I do. This is not yeah. Rado's forte, so we'll jump to one that not necessarily is, but can fit in this, and this is called Catch the Leader. Yes, I appreciate I, it because all I was going to have to say about card play conflict was. Well, I just got Cosmic Encounter Duel the other day, so I can talk about that, and that was pretty much it. Well, it actually is in that game. Yes. It is a good chunk of that game. Yeah, um, that, that's pretty much the whole game at this point, almost. That's since they true. took, you know, 70% of the rest of the game out just to make it a tight little package. So, but we're um, talking catching the leader. Let's catch a leader, shall we? Uh, you know what, folks? I know why you're hearing Rado twice. You should now only hear him once. Oh, was I doubled up? It was on my end of things, so you should be fine now. Excellent. Um, folks, for folks who don't know, huge, uh, you know, mega shout out to Tom, who does everything. All I have to do is show up five minutes before airtime. Tom, you know, sets up the rooms. He monitors everything. He keeps track of the audience. I mean, he's really a one-man show, and I'm just along for the ride. So yeah, well, I, I learn all this from Roy. I have off it to you. Anyhow, we fixed that. <laughs> the audio is now fixed. I know what the problem was, so I was able to fix that. So, oh, anyhow. Me having a subtle way of saying, oh, by the way, every mistake is Tom's, too. Although I guess that was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to give a positive shout out there. All right. So, Catch the Leader is what we're talking about. So, this is games which advantage players that are behind or disadvantage players that are ahead. And I, and I actually... This one has been in my mind lately because I just played a game like this, and I'm 
Uh, it was Alma Mater. That's what it was. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, I, have you played Alma Mater yet? Nope, I've got it. I, I'll be covering it next month. I'm very excited uh, since I love Coimbra so much. So, uh, But no, I haven't tried it yet. But tell us more. Well, no, I was just going to say, an Alma Mater, if you are behind on this uh, research track, your yeah. books are worth the least, but you get extra money from round to round. The number one example of this is Power Grid. In Power Grid, if you are far ahead, you are last in picking of the resources. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of games like that where if you uh, are winning, you get to pick first. There's that new train game from Capstone that does this also where you pick last uh, if you're first. And then if you're, you also, so there's advantages in these kind of games. It's also, it's usually advantageous for you to be not in first until the very end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you can leverage the catch-up mechanism. Yeah. I don't know if you've played Power Grid. Yep, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, not a very good two-player game. Even with the robots. Even with double robots I tried. and You tried still... with double robots? That must have made your head explode. It was a lot. It was a lot. I will tell you that right now. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Other ones on this list. Isle of Sky. I'm trying to think. What is the last... The last part oh, gets to pick first. I love Isle of Sky, and I don't really remember. Um, yeah, what did they do? It, it, I'm, I'm sure someone in the audience can remind us, because they, so, they actually know it, games better than either of us, obviously. Well, Quacks um, of Quedlingburg, that one I know. If yeah. you're behind, you have the rat's tails. So that moves How you, you up. How do you feel those are enough? I in felt a, when we played it, they didn't really have as much of an impact as I might have liked. In a four-player game, they're much more... Oh, really? Okay. If someone gets far ahead, then the one person can start four or five spots in the front. It also stops you from pushing points too early in the game. You're like, I'll just push points. Sure, but you're probably better off buying chips because yeah. uh, if you, you're giving everyone else a nice head start on you for no reason at all. Um, Age of Steam has this too. Uh, in Age of Steam, if you are winning, you pay more money. Uh, the last player gets more income in Isle of Sky is what the players, what, what the audience says. Is it? Okay, I believe it. I believe it. That's a I'm, subtle thing. Uh, I'm almost it, but. always wary of these mechanisms in games mm-hmm. i call it rubber banding where that is what it's called in the video game industry i was gonna say uh you know as, as a basically a call out to mario kart which was notorious when you were playing against the ai that um no matter how badly you were doing as a player uh bowser was you know out in front of you and you by rights you should not be able to catch with him he was tethered to you by an invisible rubber band he could never get too far away so that you would always have a chance to catch up. And I'm pretty sure, at least that's the first time I ever heard the term, was back in, in Mario Kart on Super NES. That is interesting. That's what all my fellow video game designers referred to. Because sometimes I like it. So a good example, staying in the video game world, is Super yeah. Smash Brothers. Um, in Super Smash <clears throat> Brothers, you go around and you fight. Well, when we played, if you kept losing, your punches kept getting more powerful. So when we played with a little kid, they kept losing. But suddenly in one game, they won. Yep. And everyone was like, yep. woo! And I, at, at that case, it worked. In a board game, it becomes part of the meta, not the meta game, but the inside the game works. Where I'm like, okay, again, like I said, in Power Grid, I'm trying not to win too early. It's to yeah. stop a runaway leader. Yeah. <sighs> Like I said, I'm just wary of them. I don't know that I love them. They feel artificial. That is true. I mean, Power Grid is certainly the best example that for the first half or even two-thirds of the game, everybody is jockeying to not be winning because you're losing if you're winning, which is which is certainly an odd thing, but it does add a level of depth to the game. Where I have found myself appreciating it the most, I can think of two games, and I don't know if they'll make it on the list, they here. don't because there's very few games on the list. This is another one where people need to add this mechanism right, to Right, because it's a, it's a new concept of calling it out. Well, I will mention two, and they're both legacy games. And that's why I think it really comes to the fore. Charterstone and the new one, uh, My City, which very sadly did not win the spiel, even though it should have. Um, I agree. <laughs> all right. 
we, 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 we find common ground here. Um, but I love that idea that, hey, we've got a campaign. It is going to last for 12 or 20 or 30 games. And um, if one player gets some early wins, that could be a real problem. I don't want to keep coming back if I have no chance. And so I think both of those games have very, very nice, simple systems. Oh, and uh, Queensdale did it too, didn't it? Yes, Queensdale really worked hard on the, you know, if there's somebody who is consistently coming in last place, game after game, they just get progressively more and more powerful. Well, I just, uh, actually, I just talked about this in Queensdale when I did yeah. my, because I, I finished the campaign now. And mm-hmm. I said that on one hand, it felt very artificial, bring that person in, in the end. But on the other hand, I don't think Queensdale did it enough because... Oh, really? Well, I played a four-player game, and one person eventually pulled ahead, and it even the, the rubber banding didn't help that last person catch up. Oh, wow. So it wasn't um, strong enough. But it definitely happens in legacy games, like you've mentioned, Charterstone, and definitely in uh, um, the le- this one. I don't mind that as much in these, in these legacy games because there are little adjustments made from game to game. Yeah. Some of the comments from the contributors here. Mm, um, okay. Some some of the so you it hear says, that, folks. The contributors now. Well, oh, done. did I say contributors? The the comment the, oh, no, the no, audience. It's just the deputized everybody who's watching live right now. You are all dice tower contributors. Congratulations! Says, your badges will be in the mail. <laughs> That's your job. You're the you're the postal guy. Um, <laughs> Richard says it sounds like you want a catch up mechanism if you're playing with a kid. Otherwise, you don't. I'll go even farther. Mm. I want a catch-up mechanism when I'm playing with uh, an inferior opponent. I don't mean that in a negative way, but if there's a new player, experienced, it's, it's no fun way. to crush them. Someone was just talking to me about this because I was talking about my game of uh, Fuche Magnet where I lost by a magnitude of 90% or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they said when a new player plays, they give them kind of a, some, some advantages. That, like they'll let them buy a card out of turn or what have you. To keep them in the game for that first game. Oh, it, it, that's not official. That's just a... No, no, no. It's just the way that that group plays. Oh, I see. Robert's, yeah. Robert says, I'm a fan of catch-up mechanisms because ultimately, while the target is to win, the goal is to have fun, and closer games are more fun. Well, let me ask you this, Robert and Tom. Um, the alternative would, instead of a catch-up mechanism where the game tries to effectively autocorrect a skew between players... Uh, not. I'm surprised how few games allow for handicapping of players. Yeah, there isn't. There isn't many that do that. I I I prefer the handicap thing myself. Like if yeah. I'm I better mean, than my kids, in. then I do this or I play with this in in effect. And man, I was just playing a game the other day where they were talking about that. Was it? Was it my city? Did they? I don't remember that. that well, they had a. Without spoiling, I mean, it, it's not that my city's full of spoilers, but you could play, if you're playing the the legend, what do they call it, the legacy game or the eternal game, the eternal game, right? Yep. So in the eternal game, and this isn't spoiling it, there are, there are churches, I could give myself a harder church than a new player. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing, uh, the real that would balance thing that about- game. Yeah, my city's interesting thing, with, again, without going into particulars, is you're going to play through 24 missions. If you win a given session, you will get the legacy points that are you know going to be tallied up at the end. So you're, you're moving ahead on the victory point tracker for the whole campaign. But it will give you a, um, it will give you a handicap. You, you will often win and say, oh, but now I've got extra rocks on my map. And now I have to do more work. Um, and uh, and then a player who comes in second place, they get one point, but they don't get any kind of advantage or disadvantage. And the player who comes in last gets no points, but actually gets a significant advantage that will potentially compound for the rest of the game because it'll be there because uh, they're stickers. It's a legacy game for the rest of the game. And I thought that was really fascinating. I would have loved to see it since I only played it as a two-player game. So it was just, you know, if Jen was well, winning, having then, played it and as she more than a two-player. Yeah. What's that? Ha- having played it as more than a two-player, my, my, I found that my preference was to be that person in the middle. <laughs> right, right, right. Y- y- I don't want yeah. the. I get some points that way, but I'm not handicapped by by the the negative thing or what have you. Uh, Jesse says he thinks the mechanism works better in shorter games, like push your luck games, like Quacks. 
Yeah, I guess to a certain extent. The more you are going to commit your time and effort and your day, the less you want to have artificial influence or interference, I suppose. Whereas, oh, it's just a little trifle. You know, in the same way that, you know what? I the the shorter our game is, the less I mind swingy luck affecting the outcome. And so, by the same token, the less you mind catch-up mechanisms, I suppose. Actually, Marco has a good point here. Marco says Yinch. Yinch is a great example of this. Oh, really? So Yinch, I don't, I don't know if you played Yinch. It's a, no, no, no. It's, it's way a two-player game in the gift in the gift series, right? You have these three pieces that you move around the board, and you're jumping over stuff. You can pick on your turn. You pick one piece, you move it, and and you make moves. Whenever you get five in a row, you're on your way to victory. You need to win three times. And each time, I think, actually, I think you start with five rings on the board. And mm -hmm. each time you get five in a row, you remove one of your rings. And the first person removed three rings wins. However, every time you remove a ring, you are lowering the options you have. So it's a right. nice little catch-up mechanism, which I think it does it. Perfectly that well. That is naturally worked in, as opposed to it feeling like it's an artificial thing that's being layered on. You know, oh, I forget the name of it. There's a SimCity-style board game, you know, a city-building game, where the victory point track, you have to, what, I think you have to spend resources to move yourself up the track, and, you know, the, for, the, for the first arm of the track, um, yeah, I can give up whatever it was, money, to just, ever, one dollar will let me move forward one on the victory point track, but... As somebody gets further down the victory point check, no, now I have to start paying two bucks to move forward or three bucks to move forward. While everybody who has fallen behind is still having to pay literally less to move forward. Are so you it talking has about to Lords of Vegas? Is it? Lords I, of I, Vegas, um, that's how the, the track was. You needed a certain number of that's points. That's what I'm thinking of. It was a city, but, um, where, but you were building casinos, oh, it's I Vegas. guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's a city. So. All right. Thank you for mentioning a contributor thing. Now everyone's talking about salaries. Um, nice. And they're, next they're going to unionize, so you got to watch out for that. Um, automobile lets you avoid wear cubes if you're directly behind somebody. Uh, oh, oh I, that would actually be another form of drafting. Yeah, that's a little bit different. That's real drafting. You know, this is a weird one to me, this, this mechanism, because I don't know where I put it on me liking it or not. If it feels natural, I'm okay with it. If it feels forced, there was a city building game um, a long time ago designed by Chad Jensen, and I am... Uh, Urban Sprawl? Urban Sprawl. And Urban Sprawl, I really disliked it because they had the thing in there, like, oh, if you're in last place, get four points. And I was like, really? That... <laughs> That's just hitting you on the head with it. Mm. It's not even, it's not a little subtle. Or they, they had a rule, I think, in it, like the person who in last place could do something to the person in first place. And there are other games that do that too, where um, I like Coliseum. In Coliseum, whoever's in last place gets to steal a tile from whoever's in first place. Um, yeah. And as much as I like Coliseum, that's a little bit on the nose there. It's this, <laughs> it's this, uh, this tax type thing that you get because you're bad, you get to achieve something because of someone else's success, which if the game was cooperative, I'm all for. And in yeah. real life, you can make some strong arguments that this might be a thing. In yeah. a game, not so pleased with it, especially if I'm in first yeah. place. Well, no, I mean, you could argue that, you know, if you are the recipient of it, does that help you feel better about your overall standing that effectively the game is giving you a form of charity to make up for your poor play. I mean, that's why I, I, I would love to see more games initiating handicaps. I mean, the best one I can think of is Nations, the Civilization game, because right off the bat, uh, everybody puts their little marker on a nobility track. And you can start out as a peasant, which means you start out with less than normal resources, or you can start out with a normal level, or you can start out as a king, which means you literally start out with more than normal resources, and your income is higher for the whole game. And the rules are very clear. Look, this is a big, heavy game. You might be playing it with newbies. You should make yourself um, suffer and have less, and you should give them more so that everybody has a good time. I guess the problem with that, of course, is that's just telling people right up front, by the way, you're going to suck. Let's just um, you know give you a little bit extra, and nobody necessarily wants or is comfortable with the idea of, of admitting, yes, I clearly suck. Um, I don't want to lose my 90 points to the person who shall not be named. For, um, 
And which is why, you're, I guess, as you're saying, the happy medium is to integrate it into the game, but do it in a way that's not quite so obvious to everybody what's happening. Yeah. And if it's a natural outcome, if it feels thematically grounded, because you know what, if a person in the lead brings on more responsibility, more problems, more things that they have to deal with, which means a person who has fallen behind can be tighter and more lean and zip ahead, you know, all righty. Well, uh, good good thinking. It's time. Yes. Oh, well, it's time to move on. Let's go okay, to our top then. five. Let's do it. All right, folks, if you have a top five topic you'd like us to talk about, in this case, I decided I'm going to just do what I did last time. I'm just going to give you a variety of topics, board games and non-board oh, games. Oh, we are no longer adhering to the board games on your channel, non-board games on my channel. That's correct. It's All actually right, you make these decisions, and I'll try to give you some of each. So, All right. I'm cool with that. Seeing as how people always suggest both types anyway. That's true. Right. So, uh, you know, I think it would be a uh, uh, a good idea in that regard. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I, I will try not to adhere to that, and I will just go which with whatever one you give me that speaks to me the most, whether it's games or not. Things where that they speak to you, and, uh... That um, was not to me. No. Oh, that's a good one. But that would require some research, but maybe. <laughs> the more we do this show, the more I realize our greatest asset is the Dice Tower contributing pool that you have uh, called out. Hmm? What'd you say? I'm just saying, I'm getting less and less worried about heavy research topics because we've got an entire research department sitting right here in the live chat. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Um. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, I will, uh, I will accept that one. <clears throat> All right, so I got two that are not games. Let me find one that's games. Okay. Ah. Uh, ooh, I will take that one, but I don't think you'll pick it. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that's what they call stacking the deck. No, 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 no. I, I don't know. Okay, here we go. No more, no more, no more entries here, folks. Right. Okay, here we go. So we have the top five Spiel des Jahres nominees that did not win. Oh. We have, Obviously, that's the research one. Sure. But boy, we I like top, that a lot. Anyway, go on. The top five non-superhero comic book movies. Top five mm. Tolkien characters. Or is it Tolkien? I'm not sure. Are you talking J.R.R. Tolkien or are you talking about Tolkien characters like the character oh, on South J.R. Tolkien. <laughs> okay, okay. And the top five lazy game design choices. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, I like, I like the first one and the last one a lot. I thought you might. Wow. Okay. Um, how hard? I, 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 I'm inclined to do the spiel one. I, I uh, can get you. How hard is it to I, get a list of I, everything? It's not hard. I, I, can, I can find you most of them. I'll have to read a lot of them to you probably. Full is that the one you want to do then? Spiel des Yaris nomination. If you just go to Spiel des Yaris on Wikipedia... They'll give okay, you the yep, awards. That's the top list I just got. That's the top link. And oh, excellent, perfect. Yeah, this is everything. This is everything. Okay, this is it. You, you want to do this we one then? Write what once went wrong, and set the record straight forever. Okay, so but let's let's limit ourselves. Let's forget the Kinderspiel and let's forget the uh, uh, the uh, the higher one. The uh, okay, we're just doing Spiel. No, just or, Spiel. We say Kenner for another day. All right, so in 2020, I think we both would agree my city should make the short list. We're not making a final list yet, but my city, yeah, right? My, my city's boy, Kinesia deserves more love. And what about I'm Nova so Luna? Game. It's the ultimate gateway legacy title. It does it so well. Well, considering there's only 15 legacy games, fine. Yeah. But, um, and she had a gateway one. What about uh, Nova Luna? Would you put that on the short list? Oh. 
Nova Luna is, is very nice, but it's it's not a high watermark for Uwe Rosenberg. All right, it's so not 20... Uwe Rosenberg you know, bursting out. I mean, I, I, and I love Corner Van Musel, but it, it's it's a very nice abstract game. All right. In 2019, the, the two non-winners... Two-player. My word, he's Rosenberg. still going on Sorry. about this game. Okay. In 2019, uh, the two non-winners were Llama and Werewords. I'm Move vetoing on. Llama in a second, no. but... I don't know that where words is strong enough. No, I I would fight you on that if you wanted to argue for, in case of either of those. We only have five, and we have many, many years. All right, 18, Luxor and The Mind. I really like Luxor a lot, but I bet you there's going to be ones I like more. What about The Mind? Uh, the Mind is nice. I, it, it, it's very, very cool, but... I don't know. What about you? What do you think? Nah, I mean, the argument about the mind would be how widespread it would be outside. But I don't feel that strongly about it because no, I know no, I, 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 was really I can smell I can smell the and, ones coming. <laughs> you know what? Wolfgang Warsh has already gotten enough love. He doesn't <laughs> he doesn't need this particular catch up mechanism. <laughs> All right. 2017, we got Magic Maze and the Quest for El Dorado. Again, Reiner Knizia gets snubbed. Quest for El Dorado is phenomenal. It is one of the best deck builders on the market. If Z Garcia were here, he would agree with me. No, I don't disagree in that. Well, I disagree with the best deck builder, but I mean, I don't disagree with that. It's just that I do understand why King Domino won. Yeah, yeah, King Domino is super strong. I, I don't disagree with that. Then um, in a very what about Magic Maze? Magic Maze is really good. I, I don't disagree. I love Magic Maze, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked it it's my personal favorite of those three games, yeah. but it's not, I don't think it should have won necessarily. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm definitely putting um, Eldorado on the short list. All right, Man, I got it. So much. In 16, Codenames was the winner, and the runners up, two solid runners up, both Imhotep and Karuba. Well, what do you think? I, Codenames, <laughs> of course. Of course wins it. There's no denying that. I actually forgot what the question was here now. Uh, it's um, which runners up are what the top five runners up that should have. Oh, okay, yeah, so so we're not. Let me see what it, it, the question was. So I want to I want to make sure. Oh, are we trying to do snubs or just best of the rest kind of thing? Yeah, that's what I'm looking at because that Got matters it. here because I don't think any either of these games were snubbed. But oh. in the because shadow code names, of code names is no. code names, man. Uh. Top five, just as top five Spiel nominees that didn't win. Okay, and yeah, we're just making our favorite ones that that just missed it. That just well, missed the in this run. case, then I would put uh, Imhotep because I, re I think it's such a solid gateway game. It just I, it I came out the same three. year. I mean, I, I can go on the short list. So we, I think we have three on the short list now, or four, I guess. We have three, but again, not 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 a problem because we can always come back and delete that. Exactly. We're just making a yep, short yeah, list. That's, I think this is a way to go. 2015, Cold Express won, and The Game and Machi Koro were the runners-up. Well, if we didn't give it to The Mind, we can't give it to The Game. I, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> also, The Game loses a point with me every time because of the name. I'm so yes, tired of explaining it, to people. It, it has to knock down a few knocks just because it's impossible to search for. And it's also impossible to talk to people about. I'm like, hey, have you played The Game? What game? <laughs> Shut up. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. That's what I'm talking about! Yeah. Um, and Machi Koro... <sighs> Machi Koro, I... From the first time I played it, I thought, this is such a brilliant mechanism in a game I really don't like. And it took Space Base, and it took, um, you know, Card Kingdoms of Valeria to make that mechanism come to life. So... All right. Yeah. 2014, Camel Up won, and the ones knocked out were Concept and Splendor. Yeah. Uh... Concept, I'm I'm never keen on. Hey, let's. I mean, it's it's literally the name that it's not a game that it is in fact a concept. Well, I do like it a lot, but I understand your point. Yeah, Splendor though, boy, Splendor's written down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wrote Splendor down. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. All right, 2013. 
Hanabi won. Of course, you mentioned Hanabi uh, on your in, in influential games. The losers were Rise for Augustus. At the time, it was called Just Augustus. Yeah. And Quix, which is also on your top 10 influential games. It is. They are both influential. They these were This was a big moment. 2013 was a big year. Perhaps not as big as 2012, some might argue, but still a big year. Um, I really liked Augustus, or Rise of Augustus, but there are bingo-style games I like more now. All right. Well, speaking of bingo, we jump back into 2012. Kingdom Builders, the winner. Yeah. Uh, and then we have Las Vegas. And then Iselbrook? I don't know what that one is. Iselbrook? Iselbrook? Wow. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's called well, it something clearly else. clearly gets it. Uh, Everybody remembers Iselbrook. Iselbrook. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a Stefan Dora game. From, it's ranked, it's it, the literal translation is Donkey Bridge, but, uh, well, we're not picking that, obviously. No, I don't think so. I, no. I'm not even sure I would put Las Vegas. I really like it, though. That's the one that's just a super simple little dice game, right? You're, you're, yeah, I, I don't think so. 2011 was a tough year for me in the sense that Quirkle won. And I was really yep. pleased about it because yep. uh, very rarely does a female deserved. designer win. Yep. Deserved on multiple levels, definitely. It beat out Asara, which is a forgotten game at this point. But it yeah. also beat Asara out... Was it was not Kramer and Keesling's greatest moment at all. But it also beat out Forbidden Island. Which is a very, hugely important game. So I can put Forbidden Island on the list? I think so. All right. That is a game that my mother could play with my niece, and she picked it up for that reason. That game is so wonderfully universal. All right, now we're going back to five. In 2010, we go back to five nominations. So the winner... Because there was the Kenner, right? Yeah. There was not the Kenner. So Dixit was the winner. And then Identic, A La Carte, Roll Through the Ages, and Fresco were all nominated. Fresco would not even be nominated today. Fresco my would word. be a Kenner. I, I we're staying away from Kenner's. So, I, I, otherwise, I would... Well, I'm not going to argue that. I mean, you could still put Fresco on the list. It's, no, no, no. I, I would like to stay true to the spirit of this. The spirit's going to change at this point because so many... I mean, look look but, at 20... Okay, I'm gonna, Fresco is amazing. Fresco is so wonderful. It's, it's in my wife's top 10 of all time. And it's probably in my top 30. But I won't... Because, again, Spiel means a thing now. Even if well, it meant something else before. Here's the thing, though. Like, in 2009, Dominion won. And yes. it's funny because Fitz, Finca, and Fauna, all solid games. <laughs> but the one here that I that today people would blow their minds that it lost is Pandemic. That's shocking. Although, Isn't it? at the time, I mean, Dominion was a tour de force. Pandemic. I mean, what can you do? Oh, no, but I, isn't it weird that Dominion at the time, I was like, nothing will beat Dominion. And I was right. But which one has lasted longer? It's Pandemic for sure. Dominion, I mean, it's still keeping Rio Grande happy. No, 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 no. Don't, don't get me wrong. Dominion still has um, more people. People still play it. But Pandemic just, uh, it was last week or the week before, Pandemic passed Catan as most owned games on board. Oh, right. Week. Yep, 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 yep. And so are you saying you made a mistake then, with the benefit of hindsight? I don't know. Um, I feel like no, I do not as much as I love choice. Dominion, as much as I love Dominion, I think Pandemic is the better choice for the Spiel. That's what I think. Uh, I think because Pandemic. It, it, the Spiel, uh, recognizing it as we're we're I, we're identifying and recommending gateway style games to bring families into gaming and bring families together. That is their stated mission, right? Dominion has and, only gotten more complex as the years have gone by, which I don't necessarily yeah. think is a bad thing for me. But Pandemic, I can play always. Pandemic Legacy, Pandemic the Dite. I mean, Pandemic has, to me, such a wider reach. Yep, I agree. I agree. And ultimately, I think at the time, I probably would have chosen Pandemic as a, as a gateway family-style game to introduce people to the fact that you can play with your kids, with your loved ones. Um, as opposed to something that, at first blush, looks like, oh, this is a different take on Magic the Gathering. It's like a dry oh, right. magic. Yeah. 
at the end of the day, though, what we're being asked here is top five Spiel nominees that didn't win. We've yeah. got to put Pandemic on the short list. Of course, of course, because it's top five games of all time, quite frankly. Gasp. But it is. I cannot believe you think such a thing. All right. Uh, <laughs> out of here. 2008, the only year Kinesia won. And for a game that was... Celtics! Celtics. And this one beat out Solika, Blocks, Witches Brew, and Stone Age. And I think Stone Age is strong enough to put on our short list here. Yeah. I mean, there was no snub. They they, they didn't. Yeah, it was nominated. It was just the honor to be nominated. But yeah, Stone Age goes on that list. Definitely, definitely. 2007, Zularetto won (laughs) and beat out the Thief of Baghdad, Ispahan, Arcadia, and Thebes, which I love. Thebes is really good. Thebes is good, but... I like Ispahan a lot, too. Uh, You know, dice drafting, before it was cool. But... Of those, I think I would only uh, give a shout-out to Thebes. Although, you know what? No, I wouldn't. Because I love Thebes in theory, but it is tw- it, th- a game of that takes twice as long as it should. Either way, this is one of those times where I think Thebes was my favorite game, but Zuloretta was a good pick. I will I, say that. I, 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 I disagree at all. That it's, it's, yeah. It earned, now, earned when we that talk one. about snubs, let's talk about... Up necessarily. For snubs, we'll talk about 2006, where Turning Taxis won... Beating out a bunch of games no one cares about and Blue Moon City, which is amazing. That's the that's the board game version of Blue Moon, the card game, right? That's correct. Yeah, and, and you're right. It is excellent. Blue Moon City is phenomenal. And did it ever get a big, luscious, gorgeous reprint? Because that's a game that would stand uh, up. To- Fantasy Flight just reprinted it a few years ago, and it was fine, but not that great. No, okay. Uh, in 2005, in a game that was not a good pick in retrospect, in my opinion, Niagara, yeah. Yeah. beating out several good games for Flicks, Around the World in 80 Days, Jambo, and Himalaya. Of a those Jumbo four, very good game. I would like to put Jambo on our short list. I, it's, I re- recognize and respect it. It's way too mean-spirited for us, but it's really good. It's another right. game that, wow, if it came out today, it would stand toe-to-toe with the stuff that's coming out today. Okay, so why did... So I just what, realized, what, what's our short list now? Which I don't Wikipedia, think is a Wikipedia stopped in 2005. Where's the rest well, of them? There you go. It's uh, um, We can amend this to before 2005, seeing as how that is very weird. It doesn't... But I, I don't know I'm that sure we have board game to go all the way back to... Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, let's just pick from these. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we both agree Pandemic's on the list. Yes, totally. Okay. And because Pandemic's on the list, I think we should probably drop Forbidden Island. Even I though they're that, both great games. Yes, I, I agree. Okay. My other one that I would push real hard for would be Splendor. I, and I wouldn't disagree. That's, okay. uh, it's, it's not my cup of tea, but it's perfect at what it does. And I'm sure you're, since it's very much on your mind, you're going to push hard for my city? I think so. I think uh, Celtis has to be made up for. All right, so we have... Four more here that we got to pick two two of these. Quest right. for El Dorado, Imhotep, Stone Age, and Jambo. Well, if we both get one, I'm taking Quest for El Dorado. I'm clearly a Kanitia fanboy. Okay, I don't mind that. You're uh, one. I think I'm going to chuck Jambo for now. I like it a lot, but yeah. Stone Age or Imhotep? Phil Walker Harding or... Phil Somewhere Walker Harding. out there, Sam Healy just perked up. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. His Stone Age sense is tingling. You know what? I'm going to go with Imhotep because I think this game still... I expect I know. a throat punch coming in the mail soon. I'll tell you this, though. Phil Walker Harding is a, deserves a spiel at some point. His games are so yeah. simple, so clear. Baron Park. I'm actually looking... I don't know if you've seen Cloud City. It looks really cool. Was Baron Park nominated? I don't think it was. I mean, we've got the list right here. Park. Noah's Park. No, it was... Okay, yeah. I, I, I agree. Phil Walker Harding is one of the unsung design heroes of the industry. You know. All right, folks. So there's our list. It is My City, Quest for El Dorado, Emotep, Splendor, and Pandemic. 
boy. Of course, we didn't I go really back. I enjoyed that. <laughs> it said, uh, it if, we, said, if this was a two-hour show, I would have gone all the way back to 78. Although it would have sped up as we kept going, obviously. Sure, and I know everyone, the one that everyone talks about um, is the one that I know happened in 2002, where Puerto Rico lost to Villa Paletti. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Look, I know, and I don't want to belabor the point too strongly, per se, about the Spiel des Jahres. And it, it, the problem with the Spiel des Jahres, we're at the point now where if you criticize it all, people are like, oh, you're being snobby. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. But at the moment, I feel like pictures was not a good choice. I do know that it's very successful. I've, I've, I've used it to great success with quote unquote non gamers. But I would have picked my city just because like Rado said it's a gateway legacy game yeah and i think that's important i think you know i i think it fulfills the mandate of the award to much better effect all that a pictures does is remind you yeah there's a lot of party games out there and all it leads to is more party game sales and i mean it people already know charades exists i mean it's it's I, i'm ha i'm happy for them that they won i mean i don't want to take that away from them but sure, and that's how I feel. Like I remember when I, I thought for sure Forbidden Island won, and then when Susan McKinley Ross and she wrote a, a blog about how excited she was to win, and I thought, ah, you know, good. I'm glad she won, and I feel, yeah. you know, you can only have one winner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I, just, I felt bad for Matt Leacock because he lost two years in a row, you know, and not two years in a row, but maybe but, it was but two, two big games in a row. I mean, no, three because he also didn't get it for a role. Through the ages. Always a bridesmaid. He deserves it, yep. too. He deserves yeah. it, too. Pandemic Season 1 did win Kenner, though, didn't it? Uh, that was uh, 18, right? No, 17? Uh, Pandemic Season 1. No, Isle of Sky beat it. Isle of Sky! Which, look, I think Isle of Sky is a fine game, but the fact it that it beat Pandemic Legacy and Time Stories... <laughs> Uh, the committee was drunk that day. I think All right. uh, there was, uh, but yeah, that was Fister's year, wasn't it? I think it was. Or no, <laughs> he had the room game, the witches. Yeah. Alrighty. Question right, time. Yeah. That was what fun. do we got here? That. Good suggestion. Good suggestions all. And we've got uh, 18 minutes for questions and answers. All right. Someone says favorite Phil Walker Harding game. That's a good segue here. I like that, yeah. So let me quick pull him up. Yeah, advanced Phil search. Walker Harding. You know, I still remember, though, I was playing uh, uh, a Tetris-style game with Phil Walker Harding, and uh, I think it was was one of Uve's or whatever. I don't remember which one it was. I taught it uh -huh. to him, and we played it, and he was sitting there and goes, oh, that's interesting, this is cool. And then, like, the next week in the mail, I got Baron Park, and I emailed him, and I said, are you kidding me? You didn't say anything about this while I taught you another one? No, nope. he was so impressed that within one week, he came up with the idea, got it playtested, got it published. He's now just he's, that good, folks. He's just that humble. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I'm looking here. I think I think for me it actually is Baron Park. I like Sushi Go. I like Imhotep. Oh, I got Phil Walker Harding. Yeah, Im uh, Imhotep, right. Um... I like gizmos. Gizmos like is nice. Cacao is nice. Silver and gold. That's a... Ooh, yeah. Silver and gold is a close second for me, I yeah. think. Oh, and yeah. also, you probably haven't played this, but that new adventure game is The Dungeon. Oh, no, I did. I did. Uh, and he did, he co-designed that with somebody, as I recall. Yeah, and I really like that. It was just... But that one was more of a family experience with me and my kids, but I really yeah. had a good time doing yeah. that. But I'm going to say Baron Park. It's close. Uh, you love silver and gold's good. Though. I know you love archaeology. Archaeology's on the list. That's 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 very high up there too. He has of his games I've given one, two, three, four, five, five, eight, three, eight point fives, um, one nine, that's Baron Park, yeah. several seven point five, seven the, I'm looking for his lowest rated game is some game called Cannonball Colony from two thousand eight. Okay. Uh, I gave that oh, a that, that's it. That's the one for me, right there. And cacao, I I thought cacao was okay for me. Yeah, I I I, I agree. Baron Park. Uh, Baron Park. Not only is it his best game, but it's one of the best 
polyomino games there is. Um, you know, it used to be my go-to. Hey, what's the best Tetris game? Baron Park. Isle of Cats makes me rethink that. But oh man, Baron Park and the expansion for Baron Park with those trams. Oh my goodness. Oh, so good. Alrighty, soup de jour says Mr. Dreadful. Lobster bisque. Uh, uh, my wife makes all kinds of crazy homemade soups. I wouldn't know what to call them, but they're awesome. In the oh. Ninja Foodie. In the Ninja Foodie. <laughs> you don't get 10% from people <laughs> oh, buying it from our show. I so should. I, I will say, like... I saw someone mention it on Facebook, and I thought, that's two. Third time I'm buying it. All right? <laughs> um, let's see here. In a, oh, this is in choosing a game. How much does setup teardown time influence your choice? That's a good question. Uh, well, I have to hypothesize because the only thing that influences my choice is what of those games in the shelf next in the next room haven't I played and filmed yet because I got too long of a queue. But in the rare circumstance where I get to just have fun, I would say it doesn't affect me at all um, because. After a game is over, whatever it is, I just dump everything into bags. And because I, okay, I'm exhausted. I am mentally fatigued. Just put them all back in the bags, sort them into, pl into player groups, put them all back in the bags. When I am setting a game up, for me, it is genuinely part of the anticipation, putting everything in its place. There's a game that just launched on Kickstarter today. Um, it's a remake of Kenichia's uh, uh, Tutankhamun which I'm sure you played the original one, Tom, from back in 93. And that game takes forever to set up, making this long serpentine snake trail that represents the Nile. I have fun doing it. I, I, I guess maybe it fulfills an OCD element of me of getting all the cards into the right slots and, and all that. I actually enjoy it. For me, it's, it's a fun ritual setting up. Richard's, Richard says, with your insider knowledge... Do you see legacy games picking up, more coming out, or slowing down, fewer coming out? So as of my count, right now, there are 16 legacy games. I'm not counting Gloomhaven as a legacy game. Yeah, or Shadowrun Crossfire. The, right. Yeah. So there's 16. I've played 15 of them. Um, that's in five years. Which one haven't right? you played? Uh, Werewolf. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so in five years, well, I guess six years. In six years, 16 games have come out so far. Um, mm. And there's, even a, there's a couple more coming out later this year. That's not a ton. That's not a yeah. trend at all. And I, they are really that hard to do. I yeah. mean, every time I play one, uh, I'm like, well, what do we do in this situation? Because a rule comes up and no one has experienced that before. It's hard to ask online. You know, because I have to email the designers themselves. Like, we had a, a question um, just recently playing the new Pandemic Legacy Season don't 0. Don't rub it in, don't you? Again. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I couldn't ask online, so I had to email uh, Rob Davi and Matt Leacock about it. And they pointed it out, and then I looked in, and lo and behold, it was very, 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 very clearly in a rule book. But oh, that's yeah. the, what the point. Arts. Yeah. But this time they were prepared on that, and... People have seen the colossal disappointment that Seafall was. Whether you liked oh. it or not, there's no question that it didn't do really well. Yeah. And therefore, these, these just That'd take be a lot. That an example and of putting Legacy on the box is not a license to print money. And it's a ton of work. Um, you know, so much more than regular. I mean, yeah, that, all that adds up to, yeah, maybe we don't need to chase after this. So I don't think you'll see too many more come out. I think you'll see them come out as time goes by. I will say that almost half of them or more Rob Davio has been involved with. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think you'll see some more as time goes by come out. But there'll be events. Also, to, to play them requires some work. So, yeah. And, yeah. and to produce them. from a group. It's, yeah. Producing them uh, is really tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with all the individually packaged boxes and envelopes, I'm sure that must ramp up the you know the cost of assembly line production and all that hidden stuff under uh, you know inserts and all that. I mean, I, I he gave us two choices: is it going to increase or decrease? I think the 
actually, it's the third. It's probably going to stay right where it is. I agree. It, you know, legacy games are probably going to be driven more by just the passion of the developer than a business decision to say, let's get some of that sweet legacy. And the other reason I could see it from a business perspective is if you make a legacy game that does not have an ongoing component, well, then you cut out the aftermarket sales, resale issues. But I don't think that makes enough of an impact on the industry as it stands right now that any publisher would say, ah, we've got to get rid of used board game sales. Let's make lower legacy titles. I don't think that's the case either. Why is Tom Matt pin much bigger than Richard's in the logo? Because I'm fatter. <laughs> um, I don't want to answer that one. Um, let's see. What, <laughs> what miscategorization angers you the most? As in Magic the Gathering is a deck building game, Gloomhaven is not a dungeon crawler, etc. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I get angry about these things. Um, I know uh, the one we, we talked about this recently. It drives me nuts when the word the term legacy is misapplied. And sure, you know, and I think the biggest culprit of that is even though he's very popular and the game is sitting in front of Richard, uh, Jamie Stegmeyer. I remember when Tuscany came out and he said, "This is a legacy expansion," and I played it and I was like, "Ah, uh, no." Just because you told me to play the modules in order doesn't make it legacy. Yep, <laughs> you know? exactly. It's literally just playing them in order. It was it was early it was early legacy days. We were all young and foolish. We didn't know what we were doing. But <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. that's I mean, fine. I, I appreciate that language evolves, the functions of words change, and most of the time I don't really mind. It actually kind of it gets under my skin when people say, well, you know, decimate means really only removing one out of ten of the four. So you're using it incorrectly. You know what? We're not in ancient Rome. <laughs> That's Language true. Evolves. That's but, true. Um, I do think the term legacy is something we should try to hold on to and just not let it become synonymous with campaign play. So that's the one that really gets me. How many pets have you had in your life? And will you get a pet in the future? Uh... Yes, I will have pets for as long as I can manage it. Let's see. There was Lucky, Sesame, Shazam, Boatnik, Wiggles, uh, Harley, Chevy, Scuttle, Dobby, um, Tula, Gertrude. I, I feel very bad if I'm forgetting any, but I've come up with 11. Well, he, he kind of fish. beats me because I have had three, four, four dogs in my life. One of them was my, my mom's dog. I'm counting that, the family dog. And then I've had three since I've been married. And then I'm not going to count fish because if I count fish, first of all, there's a chance that I have committed fish <laughs> mass murder. Petricide. Learning pesticide, learning to... It, I got all these fish for the longest time, and I'm like, they keep dying. And then I was like looking online, and they're like, and someone was like, do you heat your tank? I was like, no, do you need to? <laughs> um, apparently, freezing cold water kills fish. So once I got that figured out, and then I was like, this is a cool crawfish. I'm going to stick him in the tank. And I watched as he went on a murder spree. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's that. Um, but... I stopped. I didn't even name the fish because it was just getting depressing. Yeah, yeah. And will I get a pet in the future? I really love dogs a lot. I have a dog now. Fantastic. And I yeah, think... I, that, I don't want to ever have, not have a dog in my life, quite frankly. If something happens to her, uh, I'll get another dog probably. Yeah. But hopefully that is... She is like four months old, so I got plenty of time. Hopefully. Frost. You have a four-month-old puppy? Yeah, fuzzy. I got a black... German Shepherd. I don't think I've seen this. Uh, you have a personal Twitter account. I haven't seen that. Well, I'm off Twitter, actually. Uh, it's on my Facebook Shut account. So, uh, I'll, I, we're using Twitter here at the Dice Tower for, you know, spreading stuff. But I've stopped reading Twitter. So. Uh, okay. Do you think Queensdale will have a sequel because there's a one on the side of the box? I think that one was actually for that game line series, not for Queensdale. Mm. Yeah. Probably. Um, well, this, Mr. Dreadful says, remember last year when the Magnificent was all anyone talked about, but now nobody mentions it? 
First of all, I don't remember that's all that anyone talks about. But secondly, I was going to say that was a very unique circle of people. If everyone in your life is talking about it, but I that happens with game, almost but... every game that comes out. Yeah. Almost every game they come out and they are gone in a flash. Uh, it's amazing. You know, the one of the things that we can say definitely about the Shabbat Jar is is that when we talk about them, I remember all of them. Yeah. Uh, at least the winners and many of those runner ups because except they for Nelson Drucken. Well, I never played that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the Fox and the Farce was the 2020 Spiel des Jahres recommendation. How did it not become a nominee compared to the rest? Well, because the judges didn't pick it. The, the yeah. judges are, I want to say there's like 12 to 15 judges. They're all widely respected German podcasters, video people, newspaper reviewers. And they, they, they vote for what they vote for. I'm not gonna. I mean, I'll credit. I can criticize what they vote for without criticizing them. Yeah. I think that they do a fine job, and they, you know, what do you do? Um. Let's see here. People are talking about Petricor. Uh. How far are you willing to go to get a special game or game promo? How far would you go, Rado, to get a game promo? That's what I'm wondering. I think people need to go back and watch an earlier episode of... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was so full of regret actually telling that story. I don't think I'm going to repeat it. But uh, at, at one point in my life, very far. Unhealthily far. And I am a recovering promo addict. At this point in my life, if once I cross a threshold of, oh, there are three, two, two or three that I see on the Board Game Geeks, okay, fine. I will do it. Although, more than anything else, I'm doing it as another way to support Board Game Geek as a site. And oh, I get a little something for it. But, um, yeah, no, there was a time when I was a diehard completionist, and, and I went to some extremes. Well, I bought Lunchables. How's that? Oh. <laughs> Lunchables, back when I was playing Overpower... Um, the collectible card game, there was special one-shot promos in Lunchables. And I was like, man, those things look disgusting. But I'm going to buy them, and then if I buy a Lunchable, I'm going to eat it. You know, So I bought them, ate the stupid Lunchable, which was not good, um, mm -hmm. but got the promo card. Now people are, wow, I must be really far behind. People are talking about soup. <laughs> <laughs> which we talked about way back at the end. All right. Um, our company's holding off on putting games on Board Game Geek's Gen Con list. There doesn't seem to be much on there. There isn't a Gen Con list. I assume they mean the July to August list that, that Eric Martin is maintaining in lieu of a Gen Con list. Sure. And I'm actually... I've, I've been keeping one eye on this, but the fact of the matter is is that this this list, this this whole thing here... Gen Con is no longer, despite what Gen, Gen Con is trying to make us believe that this event that's happening this week is a huge deal. It's, it's not as big as yeah. Gen Con, right? It's, it, it could be big. Board Game Geek's doing a lot of videos and stuff. I'm going to keep one eye on what's going on. But the fact of the matter is some games were released before Gen Con. Some are going to be yeah. released after Gen Con. Yeah. They're getting spread throughout the year more because of this. Um, there's still some big games coming out, but it's also hard to tell, like, is a game coming out at Gen Con, and what does at Gen Con mean? Yeah, there's no central place to go. Uh, it's, right. You know, without that driving force, without everybody salivating that, oh, I, I got to get to the front line, and I got to run right to this booth, and then this booth, and then this booth, there's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's to be expected, I think. Then again, that doesn't, that's not a bad thing. I actually think that this is nice that we have like a nicer spread of games throughout the year. I'm not complaining. Yeah, we talked about this a while ago, the idea that maybe we can become less seasonally driven. And, um, like, you know, the way TV used to be all about the fall season, what new TV shows. But now, new TV shows come out all the time because it's streaming. Maybe the board game industry can take a, a cue from that as well. All righty, folks. Well, that is that. I hope you are having a fantastic day and week. Me yeah. and Rado will see you in two weeks on his channel. So come back Tuesday. That will be August. I don't know what the date is, but it's like the second week of August. So we'll be back, and we'll talk about stuff then. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. 
I'm Richard Ham, but you can call me Rado. Woohoo! See y'all next time. Bye.